Yeah, I found myself in Mexico surfing, going around, just surfing like people do in Halifax, you know? There's a lot of people that surf here. Yep. Yeah. I know. And uh, I went down there to Mexico <laughs> after the rug burns, and I was traveling around looking for surf, and I was with Jewel down there in Mexico, and she didn't have a record deal yet, and I was with the rug burns. We were on Frank Zappa's label. It was called uh, Bizarre Planet Records. And we had uh, Taken the World by Donkey out. We had the Rugburns Morning Wood. And we had uh, <laughs> the Rugburns Mommy, I'm Sorry. And uh, for some reason, we didn't sell a lot of records, but we sold enough to be on Zappa's uh, imprint. And it was really cool. We sold enough to really have a, a cool following. And so I went in this coffee house, and Jewel says, Hey, I write songs too, and here's some tea. And I said, Well, all right, we started listening to her songs, and, I, and we started writing a bunch of songs. I said to her, let's go down to Mexico this weekend. So we're driving, and I didn't want to stop and ask for directions because guys just don't stop and ask for directions. And so I kept going, going, going down. And when you go down Baja, California, I like saying AXO. It's fun. Oh, I know. I do it on purpose. I learned it in California. Yeah, so we don't ask for directions. And uh, so... As we're going down, I'm on the Pacific Ocean, and as you go down Baja California, if you're not going to ask for directions, you end up crossing over Baja California. You go to the Gulf of Mexico after driving down about 12 hours. Well, we were on this dirt road, and there were signs saying Peligro with skull and crossbones. And as we're going down the dirt road, I realize I'm on an airstrip, a dirt airstrip, probably where they fly in drugs. So I'm thinking, oh my God, where are we going? I don't know where I'm going. I'm in a four-wheel drive. I pull up. There's a motel up on a hill, and it looks like the Bates Motel only in Mexico. So I, there's nobody at the front desk, so I just kick open one of the doors. We go in, go to sleep. In the morning, wake up, and I realize we're in paradise. We're in this place called Bahia de San Luis Gonzaga. Bahia de San Luis Gonzaga. It's amazing. So when we get there, in the morning, she's sitting out, and she's wearing a yellow bikini, and the federales come up, and they say, would you like to go whale watching? And I'm going like this. She goes, sure. So we go out on this boat to go whale watching. When we get out on the boat, we're sitting there, and I ask the guy in Spanish, you know, what are you, what are you guys doing? He says, we're looking for drug smugglers. And I had lived down in Mexico for a while in Guadalajara, lived with the Mexican family, and learned a lot of Spanish. So I said, es peligro? And he goes, si, es muy peligro. And he lifts up his shirt. He's got four bullet hole wounds with exit wounds coming out of the back. And I realized this could be a dangerous situation. I have not told my parents where I am. She did not tell her parents where she was. We're in the middle of Baja, California, in the Gulf of Mexico on a speedboat with four federales with automatic weapons. And he says, gets a call on the shortwave, and he says, I don't have time to take you to shore right now. We have to go catch some drug smugglers. Would you like an AK-47? <laughs> now, that's a question you do not hear every day. So I go, hell yeah, Dre. So he gives me one, gives me an AK-47, and I'm sitting there, and he goes, would you like one to Jewel? And she goes, no, I believe in angels. So the boat starts <laughs> taking off across the water, and she sees how cool I look with an AK-47. And as we're going across the water, she goes, excuse me, Mr. Federale, could I have one of those uh, AK-47 things? So he hands her one, and there's nothing sexier than a woman with an AK-47 with a strap coming down between her breasts with her hair blowing back on a boat. It's like Miami Vice or something going 60 miles an hour across the water. Something out of a Quentin Tarantino film, and you see this island off in the distance, and there's four guys running, five guys running, and the boat comes up. Cops come out. They capture one of the guys. They start beating him with these belly clubs and he tells him where all the weeds buried and it's on a shipwreck boat behind this mountain and the cops say Esteban go get the weed and he's holding guns right now I'm really scared because I'm thinking they're shooting everybody they're keeping the weed I'm a dead man they're probably going to have me dig my own grave I'm thinking Coen Brothers films that I've seen you know I'm just going oh man so I go over and I'm getting the weed now I'd never seen marijuana before you know I don't because I was an altar boy and I'm Catholic, right? So it actually comes wrapped up in these things called kilos. So I'm holding it and I'm carrying it onto the boat. I, I push it all onto the boat. I'm singing that Alanis Morissette song. Isn't it ironic? Looking at the weed, load up the boat. So we get on the boat and the boat starts taking back off across the water. And he goes, this is the largest drug bust we've had in years. And I go, well, what are you guys going to do tonight? And he goes, we're going to have a party. <laughs> So I say, all right. So we get back to the shore, and he lets us off the boat. And I go, let's get out of here. So we start walking away. I grab her hand. He goes, Esteban, ven aquí, which means Steve, come here. And I say, yeah. And he goes, take some. And I go up to the pot, and he goes, see. Sí. 
And I go, uh, I don't want to take any, man. I'll go to jail. And it's like the treasures of Sierra Madre, like Humphrey Bogart or something. And the cop opens up a switchblade and it's glistening in the sunlight. And he goes, I said, take some essay. <laughs> so my hand's like this and I go, all right, don't get pushy. A man with a badge is telling me to take marijuana in Mexico. Sounds like a good idea. Midnight Express, I'll be behind a window looking at the love of my life from behind a window ha having phone sex. So I, I take just a little bit out. He goes, take some more. So I go, all right, don't get pushy. So I take a little bit more. And I, I, there's this big clump of marijuana, and it smells really good. And so I go walking away, and he goes, hang on a second. Let's take a picture. So I put my arms around the cops. Jules holding this rifle. I got a Corona beer in my hand. There's like 16, 17, 37 tons or something in a black suburban behind us. And it's on my website. If you go to Pulse.com to May of 2005 in the archives, you'll see a picture of us yeah. with all the weed, the guns, and everything. So I go walking away with the weed, and I just hand it right to this cook, this old woman who must be like 75, who's making some spaghetti feed for campers that are coming in. She goes for my arthritis. So she puts it in the sauce right there, takes the whole thing, and she goes like this. Stirs it around. This bus pulls up, and it's from Salt Lake City, Utah, and it's Mormon campers coming in. So they all start eating the spaghetti feed, and everybody's playing Frisbee that night. Nobody's drinking alcohol or caffeinated drinks, but they sure are stoned. So I wake up in the morning, and I'm just thinking, I cannot believe all this happened. I stay in the room that we had, my guitar's sitting on the side of the bed, and I go right away. I grab my guitar, and for some reason, I wrote this song, and it came to me. And, and it, here it is. She helped me write it, and, it, and here it is, sung from a guy's perspective. <laughs> 